Hello everyone, I wrote about geophagus in the July 2021 issue of TFH magazine and wanted to add some moving images to go with the photos of the fish in the article. Let me know in the comments if that's how you found this video. Today we have 31 described geophagus species. Deduct the three from the Andes, that is Pellegrini, Steindachneri and Crassilabris, as well as the eight species along the Atlantic coast that belong in the Brasiliensis group and we have 20 earth eaters in the Surinamensis group. It is those that I want to focus on today and we will actually show 16 of them. Geophagos are widespread in South America and the typical habitat are those reasonably fast moving rivers where you can often find more than one species. Usually the high bodied species occur along the beaches in the slack water zones and the more slender species are rheophiles that live directly in the rapids. The real Geophagos surinamensis only occurs in Suriname and almost never gets exported. That hasn't stopped people from using the name for just about any Geophagus they can find. If you can see Geophagus in a shop, it is almost always Geophagus abalios these days, because this fish is widespread and at the moment Colombia is the country exporting many South American fish. You can identify a balios by the lack of black marking on the cheek and the kind of elongated spot pattern in the tail. Really similar, but with a small black mark, is Geophagus dichrososter, and these two fish occur in the same place, so you can often see them mixed together. A balios are hardy fish that are easy to keep, and because they are caught in small size, they are usually quite reasonably priced. You can see even that their habitat has a fair amount of flow and water movement and frequent water changes are the key to keeping earth eater cichlids. The largest species of geophagus are maybe geophagus altifrons that you can easily recognize by the very small spot on the flank and they will reach over 30 centimeters or 12 inches in adult size. This species is an ovophile mouth brooder picking up the eggs in their mouth after spawning. Also very large is Geophagus proximus, which has the largest spots of all species. It is a great looking fish that does not get exported very often. The Geophagus found in rapids need a lot more care. They are not only need fast moving water, but also high oxygen levels. And in the aquarium, you need to change water much more often. Like many rheophile fish or fish that live in rapids, they are a little bit more aggressive, so you will also need larger tanks for them. In the Orinoco, the rheophile species are Tenio Piraeus and Gotwaldi. Both have this solid line through the eye and we see them exported very rarely, while the non-rheophile species from the same region are among the most commonly exported geophagus. The habitat you saw before is the Rio Xingu, where geophagus Argyrostictus come from. They are easy to recognize because they have that circle of sparkly white or silver spots around the black spot on their side. This is a fantastic fish that we see more often now because so many fancy plecos come from this region. Just remember that these fish need special care and can't just go into a tank with a sponge filter. Long term, these fish need at least 200 centimeters or a six foot long aquarium, plenty of flow and lots of water changes. Argyrostictus, Tenioparaeus and Hareri are three species that are known open spawners, so they produce a lot of fry, but do not actually mouth brood the eggs or larvae at any stage. Interesting that these three species are also the most aggressive ones that we will look at today. In this video you can also see the larger fish, that is Retroculus shinguensis. While they look a lot like geophagus, they are actually not closely related. All of my videos taken in nature start like this, I'm staring at the camera to make sure it's recording. Here on the edge of the rapids there are lots of predators. Everything from the small Monkhausia to juvenile pike cichlids like to snatch their babies. These two are breeding in a puddle next to the rapids. It's pretty calm here with few other fish, so it was a perfect place for filming them. Usually the female has a lot more active role with the male patrolling the perimeter. Here at Jericoa in the Volta Grande of the Xingu, the Agirostictus has few of the white spots on their flanks. 
as you move south upriver, they get more and more beautiful in color. Somewhat similar is Geophagus niambi. It is found in parts of the upper Xingu, like the Rio Culuene, but really it is most common in the Tocantins and Araguaia Rapids, so to the east of the Xingu. We don't see this fish in the hobby very often, but I think it is very interesting and it should be much nicer when these are full adults. Still further east in this region is where Geophagus parnaibe comes from. We don't see this fish often either, but it is easy to breed and quite peaceful overall. This species has very large eyes and it's very deep bodied, and it's an ovophile mouth brooder, picking up the eggs almost immediately after spawning. I will also need to show you this fish, even if it is not described yet, but it is also one of the smaller and less aggressive species. The redhead or redhead tapajos is one of the few geophagus that is occasionally bred by commercial farmers and maybe the best species for beginners. Fish from Suriname are generally a bit more rare and more expensive because of the logistics to bring them. And so just like Geophagus brachybranchus in the real Surinamensis, we rarely see Geophagus brocopondo in the aquarium. Those three are all quite similar fish. The most special fish from Suriname is Geophagus hareri. This is a rheophile. It occurs in the rapids in the opening sequence of this video. It is quite large and really not easy to keep. So it is a fish for expert aquarists. You can see this young fish mixed in with a group of Guyana cara here, and then the same community of fish in a 200 gallon or 800 liter aquarium. I'm trying to breed this open spawning species, which is likely the most difficult among the geophagus. These fish do not mouth brood their eggs or young. You can keep geophagus with many other fish, including most equally sized cichlids. Just remember that they are relatively docile and if you want to breed the fish, make sure they are the dominant species in the aquarium and the community is not too crowded. Despite their large size, geophagus don't usually eat smaller fish, so the larger tetras, plecos, corridoras and smaller cichlids all make excellent community fish for them. Really easy to breed and quite common in the hobby is geophagus sveni. This species is also from the Tocantins Basin, but it's been introduced elsewhere, so they get exported more often. This is a very nice looking earth eater if you want something a bit more challenging than the redheads, and I would try to look for this one if you want something with a lot of color. This is a relatively new fish that remains smaller and has a very nice color. It is Geophagus mirabilis, which comes from a really remote river, the Aripuana in Brazil so we don't see this fish exported, but there are some people breeding it and is available on occasion. Finally, we have Geophagus wine millery, which was rarely seen in the hobby for years, but now has been coming in on a regular basis from Colombia. Wine millery is a larvophile mouth brooder, picking up the eggs after the eggs have hatched. This adult pair with their young shows why so many people like these cichlids. They are quite calm for a 20 centimeter or 8 inch sized fish and is very nice to watch them breed. I have a longer video showing this pair and the whole breeding process. The link of it you can find in the description. I hope the video helped you decide which species is your favorite and we will have to do another one with the four missing species the many undescribed ones, as well as the 11 other geophagus from the Andean and Atlantic group.